if I have a sick dog or if I have a, a sick family member, right? I'm going to deal with that first. And my first thought is not, hey, I'm going to reply to Harry's email, make sure he's, he's okay. His feelings are taken care of while he's waiting for my response to his proposal. Right? Oh, my goodness. You're not? <laughs> no. I'm sorry. My, my feelings are hurt. Dr. And to, to every, all the salespeople listening out there, I, I, I hope that's not, a, that's not a surprise to you. Welcome to Sales Made Easy, a podcast for business and personal growth. Join Harry Spate as he hosts sales experts and business owners who share their journeys of personal growth and business success. Now, here's your host, Harry. Hey, what is the good word? We're in for a fun podcast today. I've got with me Dr. Drew Biharilal, and we are going to talk a little bit about sales and leadership today. And I think you're really going to like the topics. Dr. Drew is a speaker. He is a mindset and growth coach. He does work with DEI and he is an Ikigai practitioner. So I'm uh, really looking forward to this, Dr. Drew. So what is the good word? Awesome. Thanks so much, Harry. I really, really appreciate you taking time to let me on your podcast here to share some of the you know knowledge and things that I, that I deal with a lot of times with my clients. So love it. Know. Yeah. Well, we, uh, we want people who can add value to the show and you and I had such a great show a conversation earlier that, it, you know, I thought it was a no brainer to have you on. One of the things we were talking about is the similarities between sales and leadership. I believe that leadership is influence based on what John Maxwell talks about. Can you give me a little bit about what your thoughts are on leadership? And then we can kind of go from there. Yeah. You know, leadership is one of those things where it's, it's, if you ask 50 different people, you get 50 different answers, right? At the end of the day, it's inspiring people to do something that you want them to do. Right. And in theory, it's ideally it's best for that. Right. But it's best for the team. It's best for, best for whatever unit you're in, whether you're a team, whether you're an organization, but it's leading people to, to, to an outcome. It's inspiring people to act. It's not forcing them to act. That's not leadership. That's forceful. That, that's being a dictator or whatever. Right. Leadership is, is, you know, fear or love kind of thing. Do you want to you can be a Michael Scott leader if you want to, and <laughs> have people fear how much they love you. Right. But, but at the end of the day, it's getting people to inspiring people to act and to continue to act as though they you're continuing to inspire them through the process. And that's that's really what leadership means to me. I love it. You know, it's funny how you mentioned Michael Scott. He's one of my favorite leaders of all time. Me too. If you want to know exactly how not to lead, and I think which is funny, mm -hmm. but the you you learn a lot about leadership by in my opinion by doing the opposite of what some leaders do. What, what's your thought on that? A hundred percent. And I'll, I'll come back to Michael Scott in one moment because I think that's actually a really interesting case study, but um, which I, I love, the, I love the office, but <sighs> yes, to your point, you know, there, there are different ways to, to, to inspire, right? I mean, you ask people, one of the questions I ask my clients is always, who is the leader that you look up to or a leader that you want to emulate, right? And sometimes I ask them, who's the leader you don't want to emulate? Because at the end of the day, you have, there are two, two ways to inspire people. Either you're inspired to act the way you, you're acting or the way that you're not acting. Right? I've had people say, I, I know, I don't have, I don't have any idea what kind of leader I want to be. I know I don't want to be that guy. And right. they point back to a boss that they had in the past who was just, you know, horrible in their mind and didn't do a good job as a leader for whatever reasons. And they're going to work their butts off to not be that person and to be the opposite of that. But Michael Scott's a really interesting example because I rewatch The Office every year because I love the show. It's just, it's, mm. it's just worth having that, those, you know, that, I don't know how many seasons of uh, nine seasons of, of, of hilarity, a couple drops here and there. But the thing with Michael Scott is there are moments where he shows really, really like competent leadership. And it's, uh, and there's a whole, there's a whole set of theories and sub theories and whatnot, but there's a theory that he's actually leading incompetently on purpose sometimes mm -hmm. just cause he want, cause I guess people do the, do the job even better mm -hmm. fight him. Mm -hmm. And because there are moments where he, where he, he, he like switches personalities almost. And where his leadership, the really good leadership comes out and he does, he does really good things. I don't know. Cause there's, there's also a lot of, a more, a lot more examples of him not leading well, but it's, it's just such a, such a great example of the show leadership and, and, and how not to lead. Yeah, exactly. And you know, I've, I've got to pay more attention. I know there are moments in the show where he does have good leadership. I just can't pinpoint any right now, but the same is true on the sales side of things. Yeah. I mean, he is all over you know, of what not to do 
<laughs> when it comes to sales, him and Dwight. But, you know, you learn from that. It's like yeah. either you can imitate that. And, you know, I like what you said earlier is that when you ask leaders what they aspire to be and they don't always know the answer on that. I don't think I would have known the answer if someone were to ask me years ago. But how do how do you help someone with that when they say, I really don't know, I'm just kind of doing it, I'm kind of winging it to some degree. Where, where's a good place to start for someone like that? Well, honestly, to be honest, those are some of my favorite answers because it, it gets them to think outside the box immediately because what I'm going to do now is I'm going to tell you, okay, well, who's a leader you've seen in fiction, right? Mm. In a book, a movie, a TV show, right? Or a celebrity, something like that, or a sports figure. You know, th within any one of those genres, if you find one example of someone that you look up to, or one example of someone that you like, I want to be like that guy or that girl or that woman or whatever, right? However you want to define it. I want to be like that person. I want to be like that kind of a leader or, or that kind of an, an inspiration to people. Well, now they have a picture in mind and they can shoot for that, right? And, and that's always the first step when I'm working with a client is getting to understand what the picture of what they're working towards, mm -hmm. right? Whether that's already in their minds or whether they have, we have to work on formulating that. That's really a great set to work on to get them to get where they want to go. Not unlike sales. Right. When you're selling, when you're trying to talk to somebody about what the, what the product or service you're selling is going to do for them, you want them to see that future state for themselves, right? And see what they, where they're going to go once they, once they buy from you and wh why they should buy from you. Same thing is true with leadership, right? It's like, I'm, we're working together to make you a better leader. Well, what does a better leader look like compared to what you are right now? What are we shooting for? And then we know where we, where we get there. Yeah, a hundred percent. So if you think about leaders, like older people like me, I've often referred to great leaders as like Vince Lombardi. Mm -hmm. And I look, I mean, so today, what worked back in the 60s and early 70s may not work today. I mean, General Patton was another one. I mean, I watched the movie Patton back when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I was whatever, 10, 12 years old. And it, it made an impression on me as to, well, I'm, I don't really want to be like that guy. I mean, I'm sure it was great in World War II and where you had to do what he needed to get done. But leadership today, it's my way or the highway. I just don't think flies nearly as much as it did in the past. What's your thought on that? Yeah, that's not leadership, right? That's, the, that's being a dictator. That's, that's, yeah. that's being put in a position of power. And I think that's the other part of the dynamic people don't necessarily realize. Being a leader doesn't require you to be in a role or position of power, right? Yeah. Having a title. Leaders like don't it. automatically have titles, right? You can be an amazing, amazing leader and have zero title in an organization. Mm. I've been part of organizations, I've coached organizations where the strongest leader was not the CEO or the, the manager of the, of the team or anything like that. It's just some random person who's been there for a while and knows what the hell they're talking about, Yeah. right? And they have, and the funny, the funniest thing is oftentimes, uh, I don't know how, I don't I would say more often than not, but a lot of times I've seen this, where that particular person has zero desire to be a, a, a people leader, right? right? They just love the subject matter that they're working in so much. And everyone looks at them and respects their opinion and, and what they say. And if they say, hey, you know, this is gonna be a really great, great way to do this. Why don't we do this way? Everyone's like, let's do it. How do we, how do we support you doing that? You know, and mm -hmm. that's the kind of reaction you wanna get from the leadership, from, from, as a leader from your team or from the people who support you. Yeah, I mean, I can think of, I'm not saying this to pat myself on the back, but when people say you're like the manager of the team and you're not, then that's a good indicator that you probably cut out or your role could be leading. Mm -hmm. I remember saying specifically to my boss one year, I said, I really like working the room. I like working the sales bullpen and going around and helping people, not mm -hmm. realizing <laughs> where that was going to lead, but it <laughs> led somewhere and it brought me out on my path. But it was stuff that I was, it was all about helping people be better in sales. And thus I got this servant leadership thing going on. But one of my first mistakes was imitating people who were getting the job done mm. through, you know, lots of yelling and threats of, you know, losing your job and so forth. And as someone said to me, which I thought was really the, and I can still, envision this is the person said i liked you a lot more when you weren't a manager and I'm like, oh man time for a change so <laughs> that's yeah. when i turned into the barking dog versus the dog that everyone wanted to pat so any thoughts on that 
Yeah, no, I mean, and honestly, again, there's another parallel between leadership and sales, right? Is is those two things are, I think sales is taught more often than leadership is, but I, in the course of a normal person's career, right? Or, or school trajectory, I should say, there's no opportunity to learn sales, right? In school, right. or there's no opportunity to learn leadership in school either. It's kind of, you, you do, you emulate what you've seen and what you've seen that works. And if you haven't seen anything that works, well, you're going to emulate what sucks. Right? <laughs> and you're going to wonder why you're not getting any, any responses, you know, like, and, and, to your point, you're seeing the, these people who are in this role and like, oh, when I'm in the, this manager role, I have to do this. I have to behave a certain way. And that the, the way doesn't get results, but you don't necessarily know that. You're like, oh, that's what that means to be in that role. And so then you're going to do that thing. And then you got to figure out for yourself as quickly as you can <laughs> before you lose your entire staff. Like, oh, this is not how I need to be acting or how a leader is going to really inspire people to act. You know, and, and to your point about threats, there was a, I watched this interview with, with this, the CIA, former CIA person and, and he he was talking about i forgot what his role in cia was but he was an, he was an operative i forgot where but he was talking mm -hmm. about influence and how they as a handler he has to you know he has to motivate people to, to do what they do and there of the there's four ways four primary ways to, to to influence people to do things and the last resort the absolute last resort is threat mm -hmm. right that's the absolute last resort if you can't get through any of the others, and the other ones are like when, you know, talking about people's beliefs, like appealing to their beliefs is number one. If they have an ideology, that, that's that's the one where you, you can really focus on that, right? The second one is, I, is I think, the the winning for the family, like people that, that, that they believe in, people that they love. And then the third one is, third way is for themselves. And then the fourth way is a threat, mm -hmm. right? So the, the first three are, are winning situations where that person feels like they won and they're like they, they're going to get something. And the fourth way is whether they feel like there's something being taken away if, if they don't act. And that's the fear one. Mm. And that's the last resort because it doesn't work all the time. It only works for so long. Right. Right. And you burn, you've burnt that bridge once you've done that once. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Uh, I love how conversations kind of tr give, <laughs> to get the gears going. Yeah. And, you know, so you just made me think of the carrot and the stick. Mm -hmm. So I've been around in sales. There's like, you got to have a reward and you got to have the penalty. Yeah. And it's like, why do you have to have penalties? I'm a person that is going to do my best regardless. And if it, my best doesn't jive, do you want to threaten me with penalties? Because that's going to put me in a funk. And now you're going to impact my results. Mm -hmm. And I think this is, I mean, it, I, I've tried to do some research on it. It seems like there's a couple schools or more, probably more than a couple schools of thoughts on it. But I mean, it's like, you got the carrot, you got to have a stick. And I'm, this is the Sales Made Easy podcast. I am open to new ideas, Drew. If you say I need a stick, I'm definitely going to consider it. But I'm curious as to what your thoughts are as, in leadership as to where the stick, if it still fits and how so. I think that the, sticks, the stick plays a role, right? But it doesn't, it doesn't have to. It shouldn't have to is what I'm saying. Right. I think you need the stick in case of, in case of an emergency. Right. And, and, and that's, and it's like a breaking glass, breaking case, the glass case, breaking case of emergency. You know what I mean? That's yeah. Okay. Stick. Right. And it depends, I think too, on the <laughs> severity of what's getting done or not getting done. Right. So well, I'll take it even yeah. further. It depends on okay. your team on who you yeah. bring onto your team. Right. Okay. If you're conscientious about who you bring onto your team as part of, and you've built a strong culture, Right? This all comes out of leadership too. This is all part of the part of the whole being a being good leader, right? You're building, you're doing everything around this inspiration. So you're you want to inspire inspire your team. Okay, what does that mean? It means I want to have something in common with my team. I want to have a common belief. I want to have a common goal. I, I want to have a common common respect among my my team. So I'm going to build a team that has all those things to facilitate me to be able to inspire them to do this action, this these work, this work that I want them to do. So I do that. I build this team. Well, now I already have people on the, on the team who are motivated by similar things. They, they have different perspectives that, that that's the idea is they have the diverse perspectives that they can all feel like they can contribute and but they all have, are working toward the same goal right so we're all on the same page in that world perfect world i get it you know ideal world you don't need a stick because everyone's motivated by getting the team to be better by achieving the goal by everyone supporting everyone else and you built a strong community now let's say reality hits and you, hit, you bring someone in by accident because you need to grow, grow the team and this person presented really well in the interview didn't see any, any red flags they show up and now they're kind of bringing the team down. They're, they're not doing what they need to do. And they're not motivated by what you thought they were motivated by. They're not in the same culture as the rest of the team, right? They're not a good fit. They're changing the culture of the team. That's where the stick might come into play because yeah. you need, because that person might need that extra oomph to get them started. Also, because they're not used to a carrot. They don't believe in carrots. 
because that person may not have ever experienced a true win-win situation, right? Right. Yeah. And so now if they've only known stick, well, nothing else is going to motivate them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And there's only so many chances you can give in that mind viewpoint. I'm a hundred percent on board with, you don't just keep giving carrots to somebody that's disrespecting, showing up late, not doing what you're asking to do and so forth. But there's this other thing that goes on in sales that is a fine line between getting everyone to think the, exactly the way ownership wants to think and they're not, they're individuals. Right. And so I look at it as you, know, you got to take some bad with the good. You can't just mm -hmm. say, well, I want all this good and then I'm going to threaten the person and risk losing the good. And so you weigh out, in my opinion, how much value is the person bringing to your organization versus your whatever hang ups, what your what a perfect world looks like. So yeah. I've had these conversations. Typically owners don't unless they come from a sales background, they don't often get sales. And so they want, well, why doesn't the person do like I said? And it's like, well, look at the 90% of what they do. Yeah. And then now you're looking at 10% of what they don't do well or what they're struggling with or what they don't want to do. Do you want to risk the 90%? And I remember an example where a person was like a a million dollar producer, which is a good number in the industry I was in, which is selling mm -hmm. copiers is a very good number. Mm -hmm. And ownership was frustrated that the person didn't use a CRM. And it's like, okay, so do you want to lose a million dollars? Because the person's got the data, they're not putting it in the CRM, I get it. But is there another solution? And it's like, no, we've had enough. They frustrated the rep enough. He says, you know, I'm out of here. I'll take my million dollars of revenue and go for a comp go with a competition and come back and take your accounts, which is what he did. So a lesson learned there, I think for some, but it's just, it's interesting how you can see that getting into go into play when you're trying to talk to a leader, the whatever. So president, and you're saying, look, this is what is going on. This is what's going to happen. And sometimes they just don't want to listen. Yeah, it's perspective, right? And and, and yeah. to what I said earlier, is, and motivations, I, I think I, I, over, I oversimplified motivations a bit, right? Because everyone's motivation mm -hmm. is a little bit different. But make sure that, that, that you actually understand the motivations of people in your team. They don't have to be the same. You have to mm -hmm. understand them, right? Right. And that person, for example, right? They may be a certain personality type or have a certain motivation. And CRMs are not, uh, there, there's, a, there's a whole, whole we can have a whole nother conversation about evaluations <laughs> and assessments and stuff, right? But there are a couple of assessments out there that, that are really powerful in terms of assessing motivations, what motivates different people and what their values are. And there's some people who are, no matter how good at what they, they are, at what they do, they are absolutely resistant and repellent from admin work, mm -hmm. what they perceive to be admin work, right? Yep. And putting something in a CRM, right, is an admin situation. It's like, okay, well, now I got to spend 20 minutes after I made this a huge sale, I'm excited about it. Now I got to come down to earth and, and do this, do, put this stuff in this, in a CRM. That's a tedious task. I don't want, I don't want to do this. Right. Right. Well, how much does that million dollars matter to you as a company? Right. Right. If it matters a lot, then why yeah. don't you bring someone on who actually enjoy Cause there are people out there who love CRM. They do. Right? There are. I know it. it's crazy. And they love, it's and true. Bring them on for the whole team. So now that the right. whole team has a support. Yeah. And now you've, you've got a, a whole nother level of, of scale happening. Cause it, that's not scale, but scale naturally. Right. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So, and this is where, again, I think the frustration of some in leadership say, well, I want the person to do what I'm asking. I'm paying them enough. They should go ahead and just do what I'm asking. And then they get really frustrated. But like you mentioned, sometimes you have to look at the personality mm -hmm. and the people that can go out and get doors, you know, not literally slammed in their face, but sometimes <laughs> periodically yeah. they're getting told to leave. You're not welcome here. I mean, it's not always roses when you go out in a sales environment, right? Especially if you're prospecting, mm -hmm. you don't know what you're going to come across. And so the people that have those personalities are probably, you know, they're frontline people that, you know, have to get excited and to go do that stuff. Probably not going to sit back behind a computer and look at spreadsheets and want to enter in data. That's just not, it's not the same person, but you take the person that's really good at the data they're probably not going to want to go out and prospect. Right. I mean, they'd be paralyzed just at the idea. They get in the car and say, "Nah, please take me back to the office. It's a safe place or something." Well, so, well, yeah. Thoughts? I had, 
I had a situation similar to that. Sorry, I don't want to cut you off. My bad. No, no, you're good. I'm, I'm rambling. No, no, I, I had some some situation that to what you're talking about actually. Now, now I'm remembering this situation it was pretty funny. So it wasn't quite to the level to the level you're talking about. But this guy, he had two people on his team who were selling for him, right? And they were producing w w pretty well. One of the guys was way above and beyond, right? And similar, it, it wasn't a, a CRM. It was it was a challenge. It was it was sending information to to. Through a similar similar thing it wasn't CR, but like through a, a certain process, and this guy wasn't following the process. He was just doing his own thing, but he was getting the business, mm -hmm. and he was selling really well. And the, and the the business owner was like, "Man, this guy's frustrating." You know, my secretary is frustrating other people, and, and other people are kind of getting jealous of him. Like the other guy in the team was getting jealous because he was like, "I have to do all this stuff. Why doesn't this guy have to do it?" And so, you know, I was like, "Okay, well, maybe it was a rough analogy, but I was like, okay, can you do a backflip?" And the guy's like, "No, okay." Well, that's why people in, who are in the Olympics can are in the Olympics, and that's why you're, you're you're doing this work here, right? Everyone has a different role to play, and if we look at in the job description, nowhere did it say you have to follow this 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 particular process. It said you mm -hmm. have to sell, and this guy mm -hmm. was doing what he was what he was hired to do. Now, if you put that in the job description, it makes sense, right? In the job description of being Olympics, it says you have to do a backflip. In the right. job job description of of selling this company, this this thing, this stuff in the company, it says you have to sell. But if he doesn't say you have to go through this entire process and you walk through the whole process with them in the job application. If you're worried it's going to scare people away, it probably will. And there's a reason for that because he doesn't want to do it to your right. point, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is, this brings up the fairness thing. Mm -hmm. I'm hesitating because I bring up fairness in the sense that I want to be fair as a leader, mm -hmm. but do I treat people differently? And the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. you, I believe you have to, people are not the same. So if right. you treat people the same, and say, well, this is fair across. I'm treating you, you know, superstar, high, per, you know, high D or high disc profile, high D personality one way, because I know that's how the person is going to thrive versus somebody who is, you know, very detail oriented and so forth. And is going to ask me a question. I can say to the high D one thing, and the person that's super detail oriented, I could say the same answer and they're going to walk away frustrated. And I could say, well, I gave them both the same answer. I'm being more than fair, but I'm really not being fair. Right. Yep. I mean, what's your thought? Yeah. This gets into the, to the concept of equality versus equity. Right. Yeah. And, and, and the diversity and people, you know, I, I know people are DEI out these days because of all the, the nonsense out there right now in, in that space, but it really is DEI and DEI is a lot more than people think it is. Okay. Separate conversation again, but equity yep. versus equality, right? I, what you described is, is a perfect example of, of how those things are different, right? Everyone is not the same. If you gave everyone exactly the same thing, that's equality. But if you give everyone the same, the, the same opportunity to have those things, that's like equity, right? So what you're talking about is saying, okay, I'm, I'm going to, Build a connection with my staff. That's going to look different with every every person that I work with, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do one pizza party a week and expect everyone to, to respond the same, right? I'm not going to be like, oh, everyone gets you know a birthday cake once a month, you know, <laughs> like oh yeah, everyone's happy. Yeah, it's like okay, I'm I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I might talk to Steve about cars. I might talk to Susie about you know her kids and and her family, and I might talk to John about you know traveling. You know that these everyone has different activities and these different things yeah. that, that I want to appeal to and build rapport with. Everyone has their own beliefs and activities and, and things that they, that they engage in and so you meet them where they are and that's the other part of being a leader too is like meeting them where they are to know how to inspire them because everyone's going to be inspired by different things right yeah yeah and meet them where they are and this I, it's transitioned so nicely into sales yep um so when I, when I'm first thinking of this is that people in sales often get frustrated I hear this over and over again that buyers are ghosting them Mm -hmm. They, you know, they get what they want. The buyer gets what they want. And then the seller gets frustrated because the buyer is not returning emails, not picking up the phone. And so then it, this massive frustration sets in. Now they get snappy, right? So the snappiness can show up in an email. And instead of saying, like, for instance, Dr. Drew, I hope you had a nice weekend. I wanted to follow up with our last conversation. You said you were looking for this or something along those lines. I'm following up based on the last conversation. You said this or whatever, something along those lines. Instead, it goes cut to the chase. Did you make a decision yet? You have my proposal. Where does it stand, right? Where do we stand? 
right? It goes right to the core because of the frustration that's built up. And the frustration is with the seller, mm -hmm. even though the buyer may be minding their own business, having a great day. And then they yeah. get this nasty Graham email mm -hmm. that says, did you make a decision yet? And it's like, Hey, my kid's been sick or right. my wife lost her job, or I've had some issues with turnover in my con whatever. Right. What's your thought on this? Yeah, no, I, I it's, it's, it's a common mistake a lot of people make, a lot of salespeople make, right? And, and there's a number of reasons. And one, you said it cuts to the core. It, it doesn't cut to the core, it cuts to the end, right? <laughs> right. The core's back here, yeah. right? Yes, yeah. It's it's like, I'm gonna skip, I don't care about the core. I want you to make a decision, okay? Right. Yes. Because that person, the, the, I guarantee that the, the buyer or potential buyer in this case, right? Is either they're, they're, there's another issue they're dealing with in terms of questioning whether this is the right product or service for them which is actually the core of the issue mm -hmm. or to your point, they might've been busy with other things that with life happening outside of yeah. this right now. And, they, and they're not going to, if I'm, if I'm dealing with a sick, well, in my case, sick dog, cause I don't, I'm a kid, but I have a dog, mm -hmm. but if I, if I have a sick dog or if I have a, a sick family member, right. I'm going to deal with that first. And my first thought is not, Hey, I'm going to reply to Harry's email, make sure he's, he's okay. His feelings are taken care of while he's waiting for my response to his proposal. Right. Oh my goodness. You're <laughs> not. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Man, my I, feelings I, are hurt. <laughs> and to, to every, all the salespeople listening out there, I, I, I hope that's not a, that's not a surprise to you. <laughs> if it is, Sam, this is so good, so funny. But yes, anyone who's selling, number one, your buyer's top concern are your feelings. Yes. Okay. Now we've got that clear. Yeah. Now, now that you feel good about yourself, <laughs> everyone feels you know nice and protected and like, oh yeah, good. my buyer cares about my feelings. Oh. But it, here's the, here's the flip side of that, right? What are their feelings? Right. If you approach with, "Hey, make, did you make a decision yet? Have you figured out what's going on?" I'm my 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 two responses to that email are fight or flight. Yeah. Right. They're not. One. I'm, I'm even if I was thinking about working with this person, I'd be like, "Why are they pushing me to make like? Yeah, yeah I, I do want to work with you, but not not anymore. Now with this right. Thing. Yeah. Now I'm cool. questioning it. Now yeah. I'm questioning it. Right. Yeah. Like, why yeah. are you pushing so hard? Mm -hmm. And the second thing is, uh, I, I want someone like I've had people sales people reach out to me where I've meant to get back to them and something something happened. Right. Yep. And the approach matters and if you come up come up, come at me with decide yes or no i'm gonna be like okay well it's no because yeah. I, I don't do well with ultimatums right anyone right. And most confident people don't do well with ultimatums right yeah even if they think it's the right move like i'll, I'll find someone else i don't care i'm not yeah. gonna work with you if, based on this right you 100%. just lost a set yeah but if they're if they're if you approach it with hey harry listen man i haven't heard for a couple of days i know we talked to last last week i hope everything's okay on your end just want to check in with you see how things are going Give me a buzz when you get a chance. Let, let me know if you have any questions about the proposal, mm -hmm. right? That's totally different. Or even better than that is, hey, Harry, I remember we talked about X, Y, and Z. We had a proposal conversation. Oh, I sent you a proposal over. I found this really great resource that I wanted to share with you. Yep. As you're making this, your, your decision, this would help, might help you help you decide what the best move for you is. You know, let me know when you want to schedule a follow-up ch chat for us to talk more. I hope everything's okay on your end. Haven't heard for a couple of days. Reach out when you get a chance. Yeah. Right? What does exactly. that show? It shows care. And, and again, this is another, another parallel between leadership and, 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 and sales, right? Where you want to show that your, your customers in, in, in an oversimplified version, your leader, the people you leading are your customers, right? Yep. So you want to, you want to care for your customers. It's always easier to retain a customer than it is to get a new one, right? You want to meet your customers where they are and you want to inspire your customers to act and yep. trust you, yep. right? They want to, you want them to trust your judgment. You want them to be like, Harry knows this field better than I do. Harry knows what he's doing, and I'm going to trust that Harry's recommending the proper thing to me based on what I need. And he's shown me that so far, but I, I you know, there's maybe questions I have, so I'll ask Harry. I'm going to, I'm going to make sure I feel okay. Harry's got to make it safe for me to ask questions. Exactly. Yeah, I love it. I mean, it's like the, the person that's analyzing. Like we were talking about earlier in leadership, you have different personality types on the team. Mm -hmm. Same is true with the buyer. Yep. So you're dealing with, sometimes you're dealing with decision maker, you know, high D, ready to make a quick decision, doesn't need a lot of details. And then, you know, so you love those people. If you're in sales, you're probably a lot like that person. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now you come across someone that's very analytical and it's just gonna, you know, in your mind, right? They're gonna, they're gonna have death by, you know, <laughs> or uh, excuse me, Excel, yeah. because they've got all the competition, <laughs> they've got every box checked and now they're, they're analyzing and saying, okay, what do I do now? And they're just, they've got to look, go through that process. And sometimes they're going to take weeks, months to make a decision. And we're out there thinking it's going to be like the same. Well, the last person decided quickly and I did this and I'm doing the same here. 
and they don't understand, so the person must be a jerk. Yeah. Not, not that I need to make any adjustments here. I'm just going to blame the buyer as that one's a jerk and the one over here that buys quickly, they're okay. That's a lazy man's way out, right? Yeah. It's, a, it's, a lazy, it's a lazy mental mental game to do that to, the, to, your, to yourself and to your buyers, to put them in boxes like that, right? Yeah. It's like, okay, you know what? I'm going to say that this person, just because they, they, they didn't decide yet, they're a bad buyer. Right. But no, you. It, let's look back at this for a second. If they're not buying, what are the reasons they generally don't want to buy, right? One is maybe they don't generally don't want to buy or don't need what you have, right? It's not maybe it's not a good fit. Maybe they just they didn't feel like they com- like they're comfortable to say it's not a good fit for them. That's one. Yep. Maybe they're like you said they're not responding to you because of family stuff or whatever's going on in their lives. Maybe they have additional questions that they're either afraid or whatever you know not don't, don't feel comfortable asking. Maybe they found someone with a better price. They know how, they don't know how to tell you that, right? So some buyers can be real jerks. Right? Yeah, some buyers can be real jerks. And it's possible because there are a lot of real jokes out there in, in the real world. One of them, they, one, the buyer could be one of those people. But there's more. What I'm, my point is is not that because that, oh, that's obvious. My point is that there's a, m- a number of other things that could be the result, uh, the, sorry, the cause of the situation that are not that the buyer's a jerk, right? right. And of those things, eighty percent of them are within your control. Maybe not for this particular sale, but they're lessons learned for the next sale. Yeah. To look back and say, okay, how did I how did I frame this whole situation? How can I be better about this next time? Yeah, exactly. So you're thinking like, how can I be better next time? And I think this is a huge mistake people make in sales is that they view it as the only opportunity they're going to have with this company. Correct. And if you look at politics, and it just crossed my mind today, is now I'm seeing politicians that have lost previous races resurface a few years later. Yep. So they didn't get discouraged of the fact that they didn't get the sale. They kept going and mm-hmm. knew that they were going to have another day ahead of them. And the way we act in a sales process as a seller can either keep the door open. If we don't get this opportunity, someone may come back and say, you know, I just don't have the budget for this. Something else came up. I just don't have the budget. Right. The way we respond, that, I mean, that could be one thing. Another thing is, you know, one of your competitors, you know, they've they got things that you don't have right now. What I believe I'm going to give them a try. OK, yeah. we can have a reaction to that, too. If we look at it like, you know, I'm not saying I love politicians, but if we look at it where they keep resurfacing, yeah. they don't get discouraged over the no and will show up again in a few years. And that can happen in sales. I mean, the person may try something for six months, a year, two or three years, and say, you know what, that didn't work out as well as I had hoped. Yep. Let's entertain you again. And that's why we want to be, you know, I think that's where we want to keep that relationship positive and respectful, even though things may not be going our way. Right. And at the end of the day, as a salesperson, your goal is not not to be not even despite what you might think. Yeah, you want to get make a sale, but at the end of the day, the best kind of sale is the sale that actually helps the customer, right? Yeah. And if the, if this if what you're selling is not going to help them, or they don't feel like it's going to help them, your job is out to get them to understand why it will help them, or to say, okay, hey, this is not the right fit for you right now. And if yeah. you say that before they do, their the respect for you is going to go through the roof, and oh, they yeah. will they yeah. will absolutely buy from you as soon as possible. Yeah. Once that, yeah. that as long as you stay in touch, and follow up with them. Well, yeah, and that, that line, and I don't, I'm not into tricks and gimmicks and so forth, but saying something along the lines, this may or may not be a fit for you yeah. early on, and then reminding people again that it's really taking the pressure off of them and so that they can relax and kind of make a decision and say, You're, this guy seems to be, or gal seems to be on my side versus I'm afraid to tell them what's on my mind. Yeah because they're gonna to try to overcome it. And then it puts me in a bad situation. So I'll just keep, you know, I'll give them the pleasantries, but when they, when I leave, I'm not going to resurface. Right. And if you always make it comfortable for people to resurface, even if they take a month, a hiatus from your emails and your calls, cause they want to, right? Maybe, right. maybe that's just the way they roll. I mean, I've had this happen where people have disappeared f- for over a month, two months, and then they come back and say, I've been meaning to get back to you and I'm ready to roll. So that stuff happens, but it wouldn't happen if I was disrespectful throughout the process, right? If I said, you know, you said you're going to make a decision last week and you didn't. So yep. what's, what's going on? 
you know, yeah. and you now come, you come at them versus working with them. Thoughts? Yeah, yeah no, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And you got to be patient with the, with, with folks like that again. And, and also it, it, the situation you described is actually, that's on, it's on, it's on the seller to, to create that, that environment, to give them permission to say no, I give them permission to ask questions yeah. and say, and, and it may sound weird to do this, but giving them explicit permission, like verbally saying, listen, if this is not the right fit for you, I give you full permission to let me know because right. that's, that's doing you a favor because right? now, you know, now, you know, I'm not going to keep bothering you with this right yeah. over time. And it puts you at ease, puts them at ease. Everyone's solid. Here, right. There's another subtle one that's a, that's a, in the follow-up, right? Let's say we had the situation where, where the buyer, you know, you, you have a, have a sales call with the, with the buyer and you know, you could have done a better job. They probably don't, they probably don't feel, you know, great about it or whatever. And you know, that this is the right solution for them. The most successful sales I've made in, in those uh, have been actually in those situations where I'm like, damn, I bumbled that. I definitely did not fully tell them exactly what I wanted to tell them because I know it's a good fit for them. I just picked up the phone. Actually, one, I sent an email, one, I picked up the phone. I, but I call them. I'm, I'm like, listen, hey, I got to apologize to you because I didn't tell you completely the way I, w I wish I had exactly why this is a great fit for you and why we can re mm -hmm. this will really get to work together. Can we, can we hop on a call for a few minutes or can we meet for coffee for a couple minutes? And I, I really want to tell you why. What's up? And with if you and this only works if you really have conviction about what that this is the right solution for them yeah, right yeah but both times that i've done that it's worked out in my favor and, and they, they've they've bought because i because i knew that i could help them i knew that it was what, what they needed right and i explained to them like this is what this is what what you need this is why i'm proposing this if you don't want to work on the one still that's fine but this is why it's the right solution for you and i met them where they are i'm i literally am coming from their perspective like this is 100 percent about you it's not about me making right. a sale and it's yeah. true you know, but yeah. as like I said, it only works when you have conviction around that. Well, yeah. And this is the same is true in leadership. Yep. I've been in these situations. Something comes at us and we react a certain way and we th rethink it. And in leadership, it's okay to go back mm -hmm. to the person and say something along the same lines. I was giving some thought to our last conversation. Do you have a few minutes where we can revisit that? I had, I had some ideas that popped in my head since then. Mm -hmm. Same is true in sales. You don't need to have the answer right there. Someone may throw us a curve and we can be, you know, we can just kind of respond and we're like, where the heck did that come from? That wasn't great. <laughs> yeah. And you know, it's, it's so much more valuable to come back you know, hours later, even a day later and say, you know, what you said yesterday makes a lot of sense. I've given this some thought and I was really thinking that if we could have a conversation, I could share a couple of ideas with you. People like that because now you're showing that you're thinking versus reacting, right? Right. The reacting gets accepted and then we say, well, it's too late because I reacted. But this is where I encourage people just to kind of listen and take it in. It's not always easy in the heat of the moment. 100%. And, and, yeah. and that gets into the, to the, the mindset thing, right? Which, which is around creativity versus reactivity, right? Mm. If you're in the moment and, and you're just reacting constantly, you're, you're not going to always get your best stuff, right? Yeah. In fact, you're probably 80% time you're not going to get the best stuff. But you give yourself the space to be creative. And that's why people, the better you get at things, the more creative and more innovative you can get with things, right? Because you're, you're more comfortable. Your brain's already working now. It's not working overtime to comply with different concepts and different things in the moment it's able to, to kind of free free flow and and have that kind of uh you know what's what a play by ear kind of thing right mm -hmm. when, when you're like when you're a musician you're, you're just playing for fun as opposed to playing yeah. with cheap music right that's that that's true with the brain in general and in, in life and in, in any interaction and so mm -hmm. in sales or in leadership if you if you give yourself that freedom to do that that space for like maybe six hours a day whatever well now your brain's not being not being creative about it like oh hey this actually is a better way to answer that question it's like oh shit well i wish i had this again right, but right the next, yep. the, you know, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. Next best time is today. So let me call mm -hmm. this person back and tell them, hey, I had some thoughts about this thing. Could I share them with you? Yeah. And then let them know what you're, what you're thinking. Because you've had space to be creative now, not just reactive. Yeah, I love it. The, the thing you said earlier, I just wanted to go back to was mm -hmm. the, the laziness of comparing. What suggestion can you make for someone who's doing this? where they are proactive, less lazy, something positive that they could start thinking about or doing? Great question. I think for people who want to really, who really want to be proactive and want to grow, listen to your old sales calls. 
or leadership conversations, or if, if you have anything recorded on the leadership side of things, just play back your, if, if you do in your head, do it in your head, but play back your, any situations you have, right? That you want to deal with maybe better, or you want to learn how to be better at those situations. Play back the situations from, from the point of view of the client or the, your, your, your subordinates or whoever, and ask yourself how you can be better, right? Mm. Even if you were great, even if you got the sale, how can you be better? You can always be better a little bit, right? You can always listen, listen yeah. to that, say, okay, I, I want to do this here. I want to do that there. And look at, don't look at anything that the client gives you. Look at you. Just, just your actions, just the way you go through this process and just the way you, you're putting everything forward. Are there things you can do? And there's always things you can do, right, to improve. And then how do you want to do that? And then how, and maybe if you have a difficult personality with a client, maybe the client has a different thing. What about that client's personality is difficult for you, mm. right? Because it all comes, always comes back to you. Because yeah. there's someone out there who can sell to that client. There's someone out there who can right. appeal to that client. Yeah. It's about figuring out if you want to be that person, what it takes to get there, how much work it takes to get there. And if you want to be that person that can, that can appeal to that client, because maybe there's a, there's a, a missing link there with that, with the clients like that and the product and service that you offer and people who sell it, right? Maybe there's an opportunity to improve, either improve the product or service or improve how you sell it to the people like that. Yeah. So true. So good. I mean, it's, it's that type of work. There's massive benefits in it. Where, oh, yeah. where else does that apply based on your experience when you start doing stuff like that? Oh, it's all over the place. I mean, look, look, look that, that, what I just talked about just now is, is actually a great way to look at marketing, right? And, and mm -hmm. combined sales and marketing because they're so closely related, right? Yeah. But you're thinking about this person, this might be a whole new, what do you call it, subject segment of the market that you haven't yeah. really hadn't considered. You're now, you're, because you realize you're selling to, the, to the, this certain segment the same way you're selling to another segment and those, that language doesn't, doesn't match up, mm -hmm. right? Well, now if you can target this, this particular segment in a certain way that the language makes sense to them, well, now you've, had a whole, you've got a whole other stream of business and revenue you can focus on it. You can create new products for them, right? That's, right. that's massive for the entire company, for any, any industry, right? Mm -hmm. But even on the leadership side of things, right? Let's say that, that you're dealing with someone on that side of things, excuse me, a, a particular personality that may not gel currently with the, with the, the, the culture of the organization. Well, maybe that's an indicate indica that either the culture needs to, the other organization needs to change if that person's a good fit otherwise, right? For this particular industry, for this particular product or service. Or maybe it's, maybe it's an opportunity to, to say, okay, how do I tailor my leadership style or who I am and how I work so I can, I can appeal to that kind of person? Because if mm -hmm. they have the skills otherwise, if, they, if they're really great otherwise, and they're just not interacting with you the way you want them to, that's not on them, right? As a leader, right. that's, that's, that's what it takes to be a leader. You, mm -hmm. That means you have to adjust a little, that much more, right? <laughs> and help them and meet them where they are again. Yeah. And leaders nowadays are extremely lazy. And, are, are, and again, the entitlement flows very freely in our society today. Yeah. Right? So it's like... Oh, well, that person is not a, just not a good fit for our, our company. Right. Why not? Yeah. Well, because they're difficult. They're difficult for who? Right? For you? If you're difficult for you, then maybe you're the one who needs to change. And again, this is not a, nothing I'm saying is blanket, like always the case, right? There's no such no, thing as an absolute. Like yeah. But it's something where, you know, why don't you look, look inward a little bit first yeah. and see what happens. Start with the mirror. <laughs> Start <laughs> yeah. with the mirror. Start with the man in the mirror. Yeah. Then you <laughs> go back, let's go up to Michael, Michael Jackson here. <laughs> oh, it's great stuff. So now I'm going to go back and revisit the show the office but lots of valuable takeaways from this on leadership sales marketing i love the conversation dr drew where can people find more of you sir absolutely i'm on youtube so uh, youtube.com slash drewby d-h-r-u-b-e-e -E. i'm also on linkedin linkedin slash in slash drewby again and then yeah if they want to reach out to me directly like my website's nine leadership.com and uh, I'd love to talk with more folks about and have this conversation again or stuff like it because it's always fun, especially talking about the office. And yes. uh, check out check out the, the sales the, the sale sales demonstration he does with Jan and the the county guy, the guy who, who's in charge of the county. I think it was, I forgot what episode it was now, but that was a, an amazing because Jan keeps keep, keeps wanting to jump in and in the business, and he's like, "You want to get some ribs? Let's get some ribs." And she's like, "What are you doing?" And he, and then they're all pretty plastered later on and he, and he starts talking about what they're what, what, what stuff he's like yeah i'll give you guys the account and it's a huge account and she's that yeah it was pretty cool i gotta see it yeah. this has been a blast thank, thank you guys. so much for joining me on the podcast lots of great takeaways my pleasure thanks a lot for having me thank you for listening to sales made easy if you found value in our conversations please subscribe and leave a review our goal is to provide practical strategies for growing your business while staying true to your values. Remember, success in sales is about serving your clients. Serve first and the selling will follow.